as Joe just indicated, uh, we have some challenges as a, a peace movement, as an anti-imperialist movement, as a consequence of this conflict in Ukraine. Uh, we don't have to talk about the fact that this conflict has um, initiated some very serious tensions among uh, the pro-peace and anti-war and anti-imperialist uh, elements in this country and really uh, throughout the Western world. Uh, and so these kinds of conversations that allow us to talk among ourselves, to struggle through the various positions, to see if we can find a, a minimal program uh, that will allow us to reconstitute and concentrate our power in order that we are more effective in trying to move toward a world in which there will be no more interstate violence, no more war, where there can in fact be peace. That is vitally important. In fact, I will argue it is our primary responsibility as human beings and as members of this, of this community. From our analysis, uh, that is those of us in the Black Alliance of Peace, uh, we say at minimum, that this conflict could have and should have been avoided. That the war did not start in February. Uh, and in fact, uh, this conflict as it unfolded through uh, 2021, uh, we define as a manufactured conflict. But we don't wanna even debate that because our position is this. If you really wanna understand Ukraine, we say we need to uh, decenter Europe and focus on imperialism. That the issue for us is in fact imperialism and the lengths that it will take. And imperialism we define basically as uh, the imperialist states that we see as our primary, as the primary uh, drivers of, of instability, the primary threats to international peace, we see emanating primarily from the West under the hegemony, under the leadership, if you will, of the United States of America. And we see the lengths that, that uh, the U.S. would go. We see how dangerous the current environment is today. They know that basically this conflict is going to have, is, is having a detrimental impact on the entire world. That basically we know there's going to be almost 500 million Africans who are being uh, negatively impacted by this war. We know that they have shifted the burden, the, the, the cost of this war uh, to the working class in the US with inflation, with higher gas and food prices. While these, these, these criminals that own and control the military industrial complex are making record profits. So my friends, we have before us a real task. Not only do you have this, this instability, and this dangerous international uh, situation. Domestically, we have a growing dangerous situation because when you have aggressive militarism externally, you have to have containment domestically. And we see that under the, uh, the war party, party, the Democrats, we see that uh, uh, there's more money for the police. Uh, we see the moves being made to increase censorship, surveillance and repression. Um, and we see this dangerous phenomenon of the Democrats and everybody else whitewashing the existence of literal neo-Nazis in Ukraine and attempting to try to reframe these white supremacist ultra-nationalists in that state, pretending like it doesn't exist or it's the, the creation of the, of, uh, the, the figment of, of, of Putin's imagination. Well, just a few years, a few, few months ago, they were talking about how corrupt and how dangerous those forces were uh, in Ukraine. So we can't play with this because we understand that these folks are, are committed to maintaining the hegemony. They say it basically in their documents. The national security strategy of the U.S. says it's committed to the doctrine of full spectrum dominance. It's clear. Now, why is Russia targeted? Russia has a capitalist economy that's much smaller than the US, the world's largest economy. Russia also confronts the economic power of not just the US, but the combined economic power of the EU, Japan, South Korea, Australia. The Russian economy today is smaller than Canada 
or the South Korean economy. Russia's defense budget is one twelfth U.S. military spending, and this ratio shrinks even further when weighed against a budget of the entire NATO military alliance of 30 countries. So while Russia is neither a military or an economic threat, it has enormous natural Limits. resources that are presently out of U.S. control, and that is what makes Russia a target. But President Biden confidently promised that the U.S. and EU sanctions would have a catastrophic impact on Russia's economy. There were predictions of Russia, Russia's bank and stock market collapse, hyperinflation, soaring prices, empty shelves, massive unemployment. This was calculated to disintegrate the Russian state. Graphic descriptions of what the impact on the poorest Russians and the middle class were abounding. And politicians said there was nothing that the Russian government could do. They were hostage to the seizure of all their assets by Western banks. This was short-sighted arrogance. U.S. war planners ignored that Russia is self-sufficient in grains, in meats, in other proteins, and in energy. And its trade with China, India, Brazil, Iran, ensures that industry will not collapse for lack of spare parts. The U.S. cut Russia off from the swift banking system of payments and trade. Visa and MasterCard shut down overnight. They did not, however, create pre predicted chaos. The Central Bank of Russia was able to switch to the Chinese SIPS network of 3,000 banking institutions in 167 countries and seamlessly process credit card transactions. So what's forgotten in the, in the congratulatory declarations was throughout the developing economies of the world, uh -huh. there's no agreement on US imposed sanctions. The response of many countries to the extensive sanctions has opened new forms of currency exchange. I'll just finish with this. Uh, and in turn has led to an erosion of dollar supremacy, the bedrock of US economic hegemony. Full spectrum dominance can't be enforced at this point. This is growing and it's more dangerous. The resistance of China, the world's largest economy to US demands to comply. This is even more serious. The BRICS countries have all resisted. That's India, South Africa, Brazil, and China. The countries of Africa and Latin America aren't going along with this. So there's a big change underway and a big struggle, open defiance. There's payments now that are in Russian rubles and rupees and Chinese yuan. So all of these are changes we need to see. And at the same time, U.S. think tank tanks are talking about how to sanction China, an economy 10 times the size of Russia. So it shows that they are not slowing their preparation. And this is what we need to be aware of. There's an international movement to oppose NATO's current war in the Ukraine, and it needs to know what else is on the drawing board. And we need, we have an urgent need for a global campaign against economic sanctions. It's a crime against humanity and a real campaign against the NATO military machine. So preemptive collective self-defense, that's Russia's claim. And what's important there is that Russia built this claim based upon its a, uh, acceptance of the declarations of independence of both the Lugansk and Donetsk republics in the Donbas. Prior to this, um, Russia had, uh, during the entire time from 2014 up until the initiation of this conflict, Russia had viewed what was going on in the Donbas as an internal Ukrainian problem. Uh, Russia refused to accept the, uh, the declarations of independence of these nations, and Russia had said, this is a Ukrainian problem, we will defend the rights of the Russians, but uh, Donbass is an integral part of Ukraine. Had Russia con continued with this uh, argument, it would have no justification under international law to intervene because it's an internal Ukrainian problem. So Russia has constructed an argument premised on the independence of Lugansk and Donetsk combined with Russia to create a collective self-defense concern, which then had a preemptive aspect to it because of the imminent threat posed by Ukrainian forces uh, that Joe had mentioned building up in eastern uh, Ukraine to attack. So the special military operation is designed to address this problem. 
that's a long way of saying that um, what existed in February 24 no longer exists today. The Russians have continued to call it a special military operation and their legal justification for um, fighting in Ukraine remains the same. Um, but the war itself has changed. This is no longer about liberating Donbass. And that's not because Russia changed the terms of the conflict. It's because the United States and NATO changed the terms of the conflict. The United States and NATO started uh, on February 24th saying, we, uh, we don't plan on getting involved. Uh, the United States will not come to the defense of Ukraine. NATO will not come to the defense of Ukraine. Um, and, we're, and the alliance was going to limit its support to the continued provision of light weapons. In fact, many people in the NATO and the United States believe this conflict was going to be over very soon. Mark Miley, the general chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, testified for the U.S. Congress in the lead up to the conflict that he thought Kiev would fall within five days and Ukraine would sur surrender within a week or two. Uh, so there was no long term plan. As the Russian phase one faltered, um, whatever term you want to use, let's just say that it wasn't firing on all cylinders. Uh, they didn't even call it phase one, so we didn't know there was a phase one when it first started. We just had a Russian operation. Um, but it had problems, and I think most of those problems stem from a failure of intelligence on the part of the Russians. Uh, they were led to believe that the Ukrainian army would, uh, in large part, stay in their barracks, that the civilian leaders would support uh, Russian troops. The opposite was the truth, and Russia took a bloody nose on several fronts. This didn't mean Russia was losing. It just meant Russia that the operation didn't go exactly the way Russia wanted. And this breathed hope into uh, Ukraine and its NATO supporters. And they began to provide new web kinds of weaponry, heavy weaponry, et cetera. But this was done in a panicked manner. Um, you know, send over 50 U Ukrainian forces to Germany, train the trainers, send them back in. Um, it was very inefficient. It was very chaotic. Um, and it wasn't particularly helping the uh, Ukrainian cause. Um, the Russians hit a pause sometime in uh, mid-March and, um, and announced that they were moving into phase two of the operation. Phase two um, dealt primarily with completing the mission set forth by the special military operation of liberating uh, the Donbass region, Lugansk, Donetsk, uh, securing water supplies for Crimea and completing a land bridge connecting Crimea with the Russian Federation. And that's what we're seeing right now, phase two. Phase two has a couple military objectives beyond the territorial ones I discussed. One is denazification. The other one is demilitarization. And these are linked to two political objectives. That is a, a permanently neutral Ukraine. And uh, by defeating Ukraine and defeating Ukraine's effort to become a NATO member, helping create the conditions for a restructuring of European security framework, uh, which Russia would like to involve the withdrawal of NATO's military technical capacity back to pre-1997 borders, that is, before the major expansion of NATO. Um, Russia, is not, uh, uh, Russia is winning impressive battles on the field. In fact, is, I just was watching the, the news today. Um, today is a very dramatic day on the battlefield. Russia is taking hundreds, if not thousands, of prisoners. Uh, they're breaking through the lines. They are closing cauldrons, surrounding tens of thousands of Ukrainian troops. Um, they virtually liberated all of the Donbass, and they're in the process of destroying much of the Ukrainian military that's arrayed against them. Had this been the case totally based upon the, the, the Ukrainian uh, military organization that existed on February 24th, this war would be over. But since that time, NATO has, in the United States, has uh, injected, and it's the U.S. alone, $53 billion worth of military-related assistance. To give you a perspective, the Russian military budget for all of the Russian military in 2021 was $43 billion. So in the first four months of, um, of 2022, the United States and NATO have provided Ukraine with $10 billion more than Russia spent in totality on its military in 2021. This is a game changer. If NATO won, if the DPR and LPR forces surrendered and the Russian army was driven back to the border, would the world be a better or a worse place? This is a practical question. You can't resolve it with abstract ideals or theories, like whether Ukraine has a sacred right to rule over the Russian speakers of the Donbass. 
or whether Russia is imperialist. Any more than Palestinian rights can be settled by referring to the historical origins of the people of the book. The lives of millions, maybe billions of people are at stake, I will show. If the Russian army leaves Ukraine, they will all suffer and many will die. Now, if your ideals tell you that that's a good thing, if along with Madeleine Albright, you can look on the death of half a million Iraqi children and say it was worth it, then your ideals are wrong. If your theory tells you to arm Ukraine to the teeth and give its fascists free reign to cleanse it of Russian and Russian speakers, you're free to say that, which is a lot more freedom than we've got in speaking up against you, but you're not part of the left. Because if anyone tries to justify a monstrous and unnecessary human sacrifice on the grounds that it's for the best, you're measuring good in dollars, not bodies, and you're not part of the left because the left stands for humans, not money. What will happen if the Russian army leaves? First, there will be a bloody racial cleansing of a third of Ukrainian territory where 14 million Russian speakers live. You don't need an elaborate theory or analysis to see that. You just look at what's been happening. For the past eight years, the Donbass has been under continuous and illegal military attack for no greater crime than demanding autonomy and standing up to murderers. This is not the work of a handful of rightists. It's baked into the concept of nation, which Ukraine's rulers promote and NATO supports. Stripped of elegant excuses, this holds that being ethnically Russian is incompatible with Ukrainian nationality. This is a thoroughly racist notion. Azov merely enforces what everybody promotes with a soft glove by killing and torturing those who oppose it, for which they once got nods and winks, but now they get acclaim as national heroes. The soul, the soul, the the left, so-called left support for it is a travesty. That's also why war is not just an invasion, but a civil war. This was inevitable given the national concept. Imagine if the USA were to ban Spanish. What might happen in, let's say, California? Or suppose Canada banned French, not even outside Quebec, but in Quebec itself. The country would fall apart. What about, and that's the origin of the conflict. That's the true origin of the conflict a suppressive concept of nation. But what about Russia itself? Maybe a NATO victory would free it of the Putin yoke. No. What NATO wants to do is install a Western puppet who will sell off Russia's resources to the highest bidder. To see this as liberation is to ignore basic facts. When the Soviet Union dissolved, the average standard of living fell to one fifth of what it was. Over three million people died. Life expectancy fell by five years. In World War II, over 26 million Soviet citizens died. That's why Putin has such wide popular support in Russia. A pro-Western successor could only rule by terror. Like Zelensky, that great Democrat who has banned 11 opposition parties and is busy jailing their members for treason. So what about the alternatives? Let's use the right name for the alternative. It's a NATO defeat, not a Ukrainian defeat. Russia's enemy is not the people of Ukraine, but NATO, which is fighting it to the last Ukrainian. For NATO, the Ukrainian people are pawns. At stake is a deeply unjust world order that consigns four fifths of the world to a status of economic slavery by denying the economic sovereignty without which self-determination is an empty slogan. What exactly is so terrifying about a NATO defeat, folks? NATO is the spawn of a parasitic financial military elite that would rather destroy the world than surrender an ounce of privilege. Someone mentioned that on Democracy Now, um, there was uh, a speaker on Ukraine who tried to basically say that, um, yes, sure, there are Nazis in Ukraine, but uh, downplayed that factor and said that's not such a great thing. And it certainly doesn't um, justify uh, Russia entering Ukraine. Um, I, I'd like to add to that because it's very, very clear that Azov and some of the other 
right-wing fascist battalions and, and uh, militias that have been working in Ukraine uh, for the Ukrainian government uh, uh, during this period um, have gotten lots of international volunteers. Some of them are volunteers, some of them are being paid for by our tax money. Um, and they have uh, kind of um, elicited a response also all around the world. Uh, just as, as the United States supported Al-Qaeda when it was trying to use it against uh, the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, and that came back to haunt the United States and built an organization that was worldwide, a similar thing may be happening here. And we recently saw the attacks in, um, uh, in Buffalo, New York of someone that clearly was getting inspiration from the fascist movement uh, from Ukraine. So I'd like to see if anybody wants to respond, or as many as would like to respond to this question of fascism in Ukraine. Is it something that's not so important? How do we deal with it and how should we look at it? Uh, who would like to go first on that question? Scott, I see you're moving there. So why don't we have Scott go first? Um, look. I think when, you know, in a perfect world, one fascist is too many fascists. It's like one racist is too many racists. Uh, one, you know, uh, anybody who does, is intolerant of, uh, of, of, of human rights is one person too many. Um, but when we, when we speak of conflict avoidance, I, I think we have to understand that, um, you know, sometimes uh, in, the, in, in, in the cause of, uh, the greater cause of peace, you hold your nose when something stinks. Um, if it doesn't alter um, the, you know, the, the reality uh, too much against uh, what you're trying to accomplish. That's not the case in Ukraine. The case in Ukraine is simple. Uh, Ukrainian nationalism is defined in a, in a singular way, and it's defined by the ideology of Stepan Bandera, um, pure and simple. The, um, now, people say, well, wait a minute, that's not, uh, that's not Zelensky's uh, thing. He's Jewish. He couldn't be in, involved in that. Or that's not, you know, that wasn't, uh, you know, Yeroshenko's thing. Or, or th No, um, because they governed a nation that was called Ukraine, but isn't Ukrainian. Um, they governed a nation that has a, a significant number of Russians. Um, they have Ukrainians that are not necessarily affiliated with the Western sections of Ukraine, where this ideology, uh, the Bandera ideology, uh, was fostered for um, <laughs> close to these 60, 70 years or 50 years by the United States. Um, I mean, a lot of people don't realize that um, Stepan Bandera not only fought alongside Adolf Hitler during World War II, slaughtered Jews, slaughtered Poles, slaughtered Russians. Uh, but from 1944 to 1954, uh, his movement, um, which had been uh, underwritten by German i.e. Nazi intelligence, was taken over by the CIA. And he was run for 10 years, this covert conflict, by the CIA. And even when the conflict ended in 1954, the CIA continued to fund the Bandera ideology as a political opposition movement in Ukraine up until 1990. Uh, and this funding wasn't just uh, limited to uh, sending money and, 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 and capabilities to Ukraine, but to support uh, Ukrainian nationalists in diaspora, uh, both in Europe, in Canada, and right here in the United States. And some of these Ukrainians still, uh, these nationalists still gather. I think Joe talked about that uh, at one point in time, so right here in New York. Um, this is a real problem. Ukrainian nationalism is a, is a virulent, um, cancerous uh, cause that the United States... Um, not only was breathing life into since the end of the Second World War, but we empowered it in 2014 to uh, uh, become militarized and to uh, to inject itself into uh, into the mainstream of Ukrainian society. This conflict has further empowered them. Um, you know, as we speak today, Ukraine is not anywhere close to being a democratic nation. Uh, uh, President Zelensky has outlawed every single political party except the far right wing Nazi parties. Uh, that's just a statement of fact. The, um, the Azov Battalion um, is everywhere. It's expanded everywhere. It has attached itself uh, to every single territorial defense unit. It has attached itself to almost every single major 
military command structure in Ukraine above the brigade level, uh, and they dominate. They are sort of the commissars of uh, Ukraine today. So Ukraine is a nation that has been captured by neo-Nazi ideology. And frankly speaking, um, it, it, it can't be allowed to survive. I, I, I'm not sitting, I know I'm talking to an anti-war movement, but you know, in the Second World War, I think the world collectively decided that Nazi Germany could not continue to exist. Uh, the world decided that Imperial Japan could not continue to exist. Um, and I am making the case right now that Nazi Ukraine cannot be allowed to continue to exist because to do so will empower um, a Central European form of virulent nationalisms whose adherents are not limited to Ukraine. And we would see the empowerment of neo-Nazi type ideology in Germany, in Austria, in Hungary, in Romania, and elsewhere. Um, you got to nip this thing in the bud, and this conflict is the time and place for that nipping to take place. So um, I, maybe that's not a message anybody wants to hear, but I'm here to tell you right now that the neo-Nazi ideology is alive and well and living in Ukraine, and um, it's supported by the United States, underwritten by the United States. Joe, you said we might be paying some of their salaries. We're paying all of their salaries. Take a look at the $40 billion uh, bud, uh, you know, uh, aid package that goes in. We are paying the salaries of every single person under arms in Ukraine today fighting the Russians, including all of the Azov Regiment, all of the Idar Battalion, all of the right-wing militias, everybody. We're paying them. We're arming them and we're training them. We're empowering them. And this is why we have to lose. Joe, uh, thank you, you, Scott. Uh, uh, anybody else? Yeah, um, let me just jump in, jump in, yes. jump in for a second. Yeah. Um, we, we don't want to get hung up on one one question, a very important question. But you know, on, 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 on one level, the, the question and even the conversation is not really that serious in the sense that anybody who's halfway serious can conclude that there are, there has been, there's today has been uh, neo-Nazi influences in, in Ukraine. That's, that's not even really debatable. Um, but what, what, is, what is important for us is to, to uh, ask the question, since that we know that's an objective reality, what is the danger of the attempts on the part of, of the European left, uh, both in Europe and in the United States, to whitewash that reality? And part of the danger, and Alan touched on, on, on a number of these things, but one of the dangers that, that we see is in the attempt to rehabilitate uh, uh, fascism. Uh, and Ukraine, and 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 in my book, uh, this fraud, the Zel 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 Zelensky, is in fact a fascist. People have to have to have to be reminded that fascism is is a capitalist reform. I think people are looking. I think people have seen too many uh, bad uh, Nazi movies and have some uh, really narrow sense of what fascism is. What we have in Ukraine is in fact a fascist regime. But see, in the U.S., we are looking at fascists in terms of behaviorism. And so we, uh, we see that we have the crude and obvious sort of examples of like a Trump, as opposed to more slick uh, uh, appeals to European nationalism and Europeanness uh, and the white West uh, that we see coming from a fascist like uh, Zelensky, a, 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 a white nationalist fascist. And so for us who are, who are at the receiving end of the reality of fascism, of colonial fascism, uh, we can't have any illusions about this. That basically what we are seeing is, is how Europeans across uh, Europe and the US have embraced this situation in Ukraine, have attempted to whitewash uh, the nature of that regime, uh, have uh, opened up their arms to, uh, to refugees. And we think refugees are important to be embraced. But at the same time, we also, re we also recognize the differential treatment of those individuals from uh, people who have been fleeing war and conflict from other parts of the world that are not European. There's no going back from this. There's a line of demarcation that's now been established between the West and the rest of us. And this notion that we're gonna build proletarian internationalism without confronting the notion of white supremacy is an illusion, okay? So let's get serious about this. People have to understand you've got to make a choice. You know, you got to make a choice like that shooter in, in Buffalo. 
he was clear about who his inspirations were. You try to put that on the on, on the foot of Trump, where he embraced and, and, and is inspired by the fascists in Ukraine. So we are watching how these Europeans are moving and embracing and using all forces at their dispersal in order to maintain their hegemony. And we say this is a very dangerous development because you are putting in place the ideological foundation for a cross-class white supremacist movement. And that's a dangerous danger to all of us on this planet. Um. Uh, I know we don't want to get stuck on one question, but uh, it's an important one. So, Alan, I see your hand up, and I'm assuming Sarah's going to want to say something too. So, why don't we try to keep it short? And 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 uh... Mussolini came to power when an insurrectionary movement threatened to overthrow the government of Italy, and the king, overriding the democratically elected government of Italy, appointed him as ruler. Hitler was appointed by Hindenburg to the post of vice chancellor. The Azov were appointed by America to be the people who would police Ukraine. They chose a government that would endorse what they were going to do. And they did that because, as Marshal Zhukov said in 1945, we have liberated Europe from fascism and they will never forgive us. These powers, imperialism, needs fascists. It needs them because ultimately it is opposed to the interests of the vast majority of the peoples of the world. And when you've exhausted bribery, when you've exhausted corruption, fascism is all that's left. And the West is in a process of decline, which has exhausted all the other options. And that's why it opted to create a fascist government in Ukraine. So the connection between the ideology, when I say fascist, I mean one with the fascist ideology, which exactly is, is exactly as Scott, uh, Scott describes. It's, it's, it's ideologically a, 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 a belief in racial superiority, which gives free reign to anybody who says, well, I'm gonna go and enforce it, which is when you get actual fascism. So if you think that that's a good thing, you're gonna live to regret it because fascism is not gonna stop in Ukraine. Fascism's already come to uh, America. Fascism's uh, rolling at the doors of the, the convoy drivers in, in Canada, right? Um, there's only one way to stop fascism, and that's to stop people opening the door to it. So it's our government which is to blame, and that's where the fascism comes from. I'll just say on this that fascism is the ideal weapon of a system in crisis. And in a global way, the capitalist economy is today in crisis and corporate power is more than willing to use massive, vicious forms of repression in order to enforce its domination. And what role is there for the left, for a working class movement? It's always got to be rooted in organizing and confronting white supremacy, patriarchy, fighting racism fighting LGBTQ oppression, fighting corporate imposed low wages and against war, against imperialist war, because it's so deeply linked. Now we don't get to choose the war, but we better take sides when the war is on us and say what this means for us right here, where they are more than willing to use fascist tactics in Ukraine, here too. And it's deeply rooted in the culture the political culture of the U.S. It's a system built on racism, on enslavement, on genocide. The roots are right here. So we better know and just not think we can avoid it. This is the war. Thank you. I'm just going to take a privilege of the chair and, and say one quick thing about it. I, I've been to Ukraine a few times. Uh, the last time was in 19, uh, 20, <laughs> 2019. Um, uh, I was there to be an observer um, in Odessa uh, on May 2nd, which is the anniversary of the massacre in Odessa by the fascists. They asked for international observers to come and UNAC on two occasions have sent delegations of international observers. They want international observers there because they're afraid of being attacked again. And indeed, um, fascists from around the country did come to Odessa. Uh, did come with swastikas on their jackets, um, 
uh, uh, and try to intimidate the people from the city of Odessa that were coming there in their thousands to lay flowers at the House of Trade Unions where this massacre took place. At night, we watched them do a torchlight march through, uh, through the streets, um, shouting, hang the communists from the trees, uh, clearly anti-Russian. And the ideology that these people have is uh, that Russians are somehow not white people. Europeans are white. We want to be with the Europeans, not with the Russians. It's the Europeans are the people that dominated Africa, that did the slave trade. We in the United States um, uh, uh, kept that going um, longer than any other place. Um, and so it is these white supremacist areas that they are gravitating towards. Uh, now, after um, uh, Hitler was defeated, the United States opened its doors to the Nazi collaborators and they came into this country. Uh, as Scott mentioned, right near where we live in Ellenville, New York, they have a camp. On that camp, you can see statues of, of Bandera and other Nazi collaborators. They hold once a year Heroes Day there where they dress up in the uniforms of the Ukrainian nationalists uh, um, organization that Bandera headed um, and celebrate these people these, these fascists that were there. That is in this country, in the United States, uh, where we're supporting these fascists. Um, so this does happen. It's something that we need to uh, um, uh, make sure that uh, we as a movement fight against. What should the anti-war movement be doing? We see there are some actions around Ukraine um, many of them do take up the question of NATO. Um, some of them, not all of them, uh, are opposed to the money being going and the weapons being going to uh, Ukraine. But many of them also put in a demand of, um, uh, of um, Russia out of Ukraine. Now, this was dealt with, I think, comprehensively by Allen what that would physically actually mean if they did for the world and for the people of Ukraine. So maybe people want to talk about what should be the, what should the movement be doing in the United States and what do you think of some of these uh, demands? And if there's any other final comment you'd like to make, please do that uh, now. So can we just uh, um, maybe uh, go in reverse order from what we did? Start with Alan and then Scott, Sarah, and then Njamo ending it. So Alan, would you like to take up any of that? God, you're asking your only non-American to interfere in your internal affairs. I thought Canada <laughs> was part of America. Oh, but you're British. Oh yeah, you're right, you're right. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, it's a very difficult situation because we're in a very defensive position. Now, what you have to recognize is that's not the case internationally, okay? If you look at the votes at the United Nations on successive resolutions that the US has put, it's been pointed out that actually in the last vote, if you count the abstentions and the opposition, America lost. And uh, if you count the number of people who live in countries which don't implement sanctions, it's, it's, it's all, nearly all the non-imperialist world. So things look very different from the inside, from the West. And I think the most important thing is to look at everything from the perspective of the people your government is bombing. That, that, that's, that's the fundamental thing you have to do. Now, being in a very defensive position, we have to realize that things can change very rapidly. I don't know if anybody's ever read Richard Müller's uh, classic history of the German revolution, but the people who were opposed to Germany being at war with the rest of the world were a tiny minority until a couple of months before the whole thing collapsed and the German revolution started, okay? Uh, the Portuguese revolution began with a revolt in the army following their defeat, which is about the only, only actual European revolution there has been since 1945. So that things can change very rapidly, and I think that they will change rapidly when America finally comes to grips with the fact, when people finally come to grips with the fact that the world order that the United States has built, the, the house that Jack built, um, is falling down. And it's falling down because the US economy is falling down. This is something the US economy, US is doing to itself, not something that's being done to it. Now, therefore, I think that one thing that 
things like, you know, the CELAC conference and, and the dramatic shift of power in Latin America is actually very fundamental. So what I would say is the key thing is to find a way to link up with those in the non-imperialist world who are not caving in. For the first time, we're not just caving in, lining up with America and find ways to work together with them. That, that would be my argument. And I think in that respect, that uh, America is quite uniquely placed. I think that the peace movement in America is actually much stronger than in Europe, which is astonishing to me. I've been in the peace movement in the UK since the Alder Marston marches. Um, but that is the case. And I think that part of that is that uh, America actually does have a multi-ethnic society. So that people do actually see the sense of Malcolm X's approach, which is to say the oppression of, 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 of people of color, of everybody who's not, you know, basically a wasp in the United States is a product of the role that the United States um, plays abroad. And if one can build on that understanding, I think the peace movement in the US can become very strong. But to do that, it, it can't hedge its bets. It can't be, t can't take the, uh, the, the, the GOP line and say, well, we're not, not very happy about spending money on uh, beating up Russia because we'd rather spend it on beating up Venezuela. <laughs> You, you can't do that, right? You have to say it's all or nothing. So um, that's why I think, uh, you know, a left wing approach, which says, you know, we're on the side of people our government's beating up is, is and we'll ally with them because they are opposing our government is, is probably the way to go. Scott, do uh, you have any final comments? I know you say you're not part of the peace movement, but the peace yeah, movement is mean, not defined by organizations. It's defined by actions and your actions have surely been on, on, on the side of ending this war. Well, I appreciate the, uh, the, the, the words of confidence, but I, I am not, I'm not part of the peace movement. Um, and what I would say is this, um, the Ukrainian conflict is a conflict, it's war. And I think the peace movement um, puts itself at risk by getting involved in, um, the perception being created that you're picking sides in this conflict um, because it's sort of a, it's, it's inherently illogical for a peace movement to say, well, we're against war, but in this case, we'd sort of like, so and the reason why I bring that up is that there's plenty of people like me who I haven't wrapped myself. I'm not a pacifist. I'm, um, I'm, I'm not anti-war. Um, I'm anti uh, wars of imperialism. I'm anti wars of aggression. But you know, if if, if you attack me, I'm going to win. Um, that's just that's been my approach my entire life. And uh, sometimes I regret it. It's I'm not saying it's the best approach. I'm just saying that's who I am. Um, I'm not I'm I'm not inclined to run away from a fight or try to avoid a fight. Um, and that's probably a bad thing. But I think um, Sarah brought up some points in in, in Ajibu as well, and and Alan, everybody. Um, but I'm going to focus on Sarah. Economics. I mean, when you take a look at what this war has done, it has opened up windows of opportunity for opposition groups to exploit. You know, in the past, it was very difficult for, I would say, when I got involved, Joe, with you back in, in, in the lead up to the 2003 war, you know, it was very difficult to be able to talk about putting together a credible economic counter to the military industrial complex. Uh, the peace movement wasn't equipped for this. The conditions weren't right for it. But you know, Lenin once said, give a capitalist enough rope and they'll eventually make a noose and hang themselves. And they've done it, guys, they've done it. They sanctioned Russia with one of the most aggressive, destructive, ill-conceived economic warfare programs the world has ever seen and the boomerang effect has come smack dab and hit us in the head here at home and it hurts and it's going to hurt more and more and more and it's going to hurt everybody this isn't an inner city issue this isn't a rural america issue this is a suburban america issue everybody's going to hurt from this and there's only one reason for this because of the aggressive warlike policy of the united states in pursuing their anti-russia agenda now, you don't have to say that, but what you can say to Americans is, wouldn't it be better if we spent this money fixing problems here at home? 
That's one of the most anti-war messages I could get across. And it's one that resonates. And it's one that, that you're automatically empowered to say because we're not talking about theoretical now. The data set is, is it, it cannot be refuted. It's there. This war is destroying the economies of Europe and the United States and the world. There's a major restructuring taking place right now called the Trans-European uh, Trans-Eurasian Economic Union, being led by Russia, China, India, and others. BRICS is expanding. They're now BRICS up uh, because Argentina's joined. And I think you're going to see even more growth in these non-American-centric, non-European-centric, um, you know, economic systems. And I just think that this is a unique moment in history that if the if the anti-war movement could somehow rally and seize the message that you could actually get traction in mainstream America, because now you're talking about things that they actually can, can sense as opposed to abstracts of, look, America is a nation built on war. So automatically the anti-war movement has a hard problem getting traction in this country. I mean, just like anti-racist movements, you're gonna have a hard time because at the heart, we are a racist nation. We don't like to admit it, but we are. And so, you're, you're, you're basically hitting your head against a brick wall. But one thing that every American has in common is we have become spoiled by economic well-being, by wealth, by privilege, et cetera. Everybody has. Even the, even the disenfranchised, to some extent, are spoiled compared to poor people in the rest of the world. And so any economic retreat impacts everybody in a way that you don't have to explain it to them. They know it. So if you can capture the rage, the anger, the frustration that's growing, and you can find to bring that together uh, so that people aren't necessarily anti-war, because again, that's a hard thing to get people who have it in their DNA, but pro-us, meaning I'd rather my government does something that benefits me benefits my neighbor, benefits my fellow citizen, as opposed to squandering all of our wealth overseas in a, in a, in a dangerous war of aggression that, um, you know, and I'll leave it with this, could end the world as we know it. It is ending the world as we know it. I mean, Sarah knows this. Uh, when, 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 the dollar, when the dollar is no longer uh, the international currency of reserve, um, the world is ending as we know it. It's going to change. But I'm talking about thermonuclear warfare. I don't want to scare people too much, but we have never been closer to the nuclear apocalypse than we are right now. Um, China and the United States, I don't need, know if you saw Joe Biden's uh, lunacy of um, just speaking off the cuff about coming to the military defense of Taiwan, and China's just said, bring it on. Let's go right now. You and I drop, let's fight. That's a nuclear conflict. The same thing that Russia is getting ready to say to NATO. You want to fight? Let's fight. Let's bring all the big toys to the game. And when that happens, the world ends. We need to get the United States off this track. And I think the best window of opportunity that the peace movement's ever had is the economic calamity that's taking place, not only in the United States, but in the world around us. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Very good, Scott. Um, Sarah, followed by Ajamo, and then we'll come to an end with a couple All right. of... <laughs> this is a great discussion and coming from so many directions. Whoa. Um, how to summarize. I think the most important thing is that we see ourselves as not isolated, not isolated. The left um, is told we're tiny, we're a fraction because U.S. propaganda acts as an echo chamber. And it's relentless. A U.S. Eurocentric media here says that this is the only voice. And we just got to know that three quarters of the people of the world are both against the sanctions and really beginning to aggressively open up trade and confront the U.S. That is a new day. There's a, the G20 is going to have a meeting. The U.S. says Russia must be banned. No one agreed. The meeting went ahead. That's a new day. Uh, this summit that Biden is supposedly hosting in L.A., uh, first of all, you know, the CARICOM said, we're not coming. That's 15 countries in the Caribbean. Uh, and then, of course, Nicaragua, Venezuela, uh, Cuba barred. 
And Mexico says, mm, all right, we're not, you know, Ecuador, Argentina, we could look at one country after another who's pulled back. There is a people's summit in LA during that um, Biden summit. And even I think of great significance, a workers summit in Tijuana of the countries who are excluded and workers movements from the US, but also from all of Latin America and the Caribbean. So these are important things for us to look at. There's a big um, anti-NATO, when NATO meets, okay, the NATO countries are, we, we need to be really thinking we aren't so isolated because there is a larger world and listening and really connecting with them is very, very important. There are exchanges going on right now between Venezuela and Iran that are continuing systematic in a way that the US tried to starve down both countries, not happening. So this um, problem for the US that the dollar and the Euro are no longer dominant. It is a boomerang effect. Uh, I wrote an article called the boomerang effect. Um, and I did put in the link there this, the, that sanctions are a wrecking ball of global, in a globalized economy. It's a world war. Every country, no country is being allowed to be neutral. And so that means that we also can't be neutral, can't stand back from it. Truly, I believe that the way to have a perspective for the peace movement is a socialist perspective. That unless we really say the capitalist competition, dominated by the US, but capitalist competition, it's chaos, it's sheer ignoring of any human need, only profit matters. And any CEO that thinks differently won't survive one quarter. If they say, oh, I wanna plan for the long term, they will not survive. So. If you feel we really need cooperation, planning on a new level, I think we have to identify with the world that is trying to stand up to US domination and is finding more and more creative ways to do so and connecting with each other. None of these are perfect ideal states. They're not, they're all kinds of mixed economies. But from right here, we have to say that that US full spectrum dominance, we got to oppose and we can oppose it if we have a perspective of what is needed for the future, for our world. Uh, I, I think the left will be stronger when we look at the wider world and not just look at this echo chamber that we're living in right now. Thank you. John, you have the last word. Thank you, thank you, Joe. I'd like to, to first just um, um, uh, acknowledge uh, the leadership of, of UNAC for this very important conversation. I'd like to uh, express my appreciation for all of the uh, my fellow panelists for this uh, fantastic presentation of ideas and facts. Um, and I would just end very simply by saying that uh, we have a responsibility not only to ourselves, but to, to the world. Empire is not a figment of our imagination. It is having a detrimental impact on the entire collective humanity. And those of us who are strategically located at the center of empire must understand what that means. It means that we have a responsibility even more important than any other people on this planet. If we're going to revive a left in this country, we have to deal with the internal contradictions of white supremacy, of the hegemony of a, a global perspective that still senses Europe, that recognizes that we have to smash forever and is prepared to uh, uh, embrace the idea that uh, the West representing 10% of global humanity will no longer be in a position to provide leadership for everyone on this planet. If we don't uh, defeat those kinds of contradictions, then we're not going to be part of the solution. We, in fact, will remain part of the problem, and we are. So 
Uh, I leave by saying that, you know, it is our right to be committed to peace. Uh, the Black radical peace tradition is a tradition that says that peace is not the absence of conflict, but rather the achievement by popular struggle, the defeat of global systems of oppression that include colonialism, imperialism, patriarchy, and white supremacy. In other words, if we don't defeat these structures of oppression, we're never going to be able to achieve peace and peace has to be the objective. So my friends, we say again, if you're concerned about uh, the war, if you wanna see peace, get into an organization, demand that there is a ceasefire, uh, demand that weapons stop going to Ukraine, uh, and demand of this government that it renounce its commitment to full spectrum dominance. When we do that, we will be in a position to serve humanity as opposed to being a part of the problem that is facing humanity. Thank you, Jamal. Uh, let me just say, if you're a member of an organization that is not a member of UNAC, please go to the UNAC website at unacpeace.org and join. Make sure you're on our email list. Those of you who agree with the presentations that you've heard today, it's very important that we come together, figure out ways, struggle to do that, to come together to form the kind of organization that will have the um, power to uh, lead us in a direction that, that can change the reality that we see. I'll leave you with two quotes. The first one is from Martin Luther King in his uh, Beyond Vietnam speech uh, that he gave where he said of the United States that we are the main purveyor of violence in the world. That has not changed. And it is true in Ukraine as well. And finally, of Che Guevara, who reminded us that we are in the belly of the beast. And as Jamu said, we have a special role and a special obligation to the rest of the world to make sure that the, this imperialist country with 20 times the number of mil foreign military bases as all other countries in the world combined can no longer continue um, along the path that we have seen that is leading to the destruction of the world. So thank you all. Um, it's been a really great panel. Um, and thank the panelists.